Hello everybody and welcome to yet another edition of the Anthony P Consciousness Hour. This is a show I've been looking forward to for an awful long time because I think I'm right in saying that this is the first guest we've had that's actually been physically here in my home in West Sussex. Uh, and it was six years ago that um, a guy called Louis Monero came over to my house and I interviewed him. Uh, Louis was very much involved in the International, Asso the International Academy of Consciousness which are a group of people I've been very interested in their work for many, many years. And indeed, in my book, The Outer Body Experience, I had a whole section on the work of, of, of Aldo Vieira, who was the, the founder of that organization. Um, and one of the guys that came along that day was Rodrigo Montenegro. And we had a quick chat then. And then this last summer, we met up again at uh, Breaking Convention in uh, London, the, 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 the event that takes forward every two years. And again, it was a bizarre coincidence because <laughs> I didn't know he was there at all. Um, myself and a couple of associates um, were just looking for somewhere to sit for a particular lecture. Now remember there are scores of lectures taking place uh, right across the campus. And I go and sit quite right next to Rodrigo. <laughs> you know, it's this kind of, oh, hi, how are you kind of thing. And it was extraordinary. So. Since then, I've been very keen to get Rodrigo on the show because he's doing some fascinating work in terms of uh, the parameters of consciousness, the parameters of how the brain functions and how that works with the um, out-of-body experience, lucid dreaming and everything else. So I'll, he's a fascinating guy. Some of the work he's been doing is absolutely extraordinary. And I'll just give you a little bit of background about Montenegro now I'll, uh, with Rodrigo. I'll be looking down and I'll be reading, but or I'll try and read it in front of me. That'll probably be better, isn't it? Okay, so Rodrigo Montenegro is co-founder and CEO of Gamma Wave Technologies Limited. Rodrigo holds postgraduate diplomas in both neuropsychology, neuromodulation, and an MSc in neuroscience, and is currently follow following a research degree in sleep medicine and carrying research in on non-ordinary states, expanding the frontiers of consciousness and sleep research. Rodrigo is a book author and has lectured internationally on the subject of non-ordinary states of sleep at INRIS, which a group of organizations from France that I, I know the guys in INRIS, it'd be interesting to chat about that, Rodrigo. Um, Mind, Body and Soul, among others, since 2005, and has been featured in acclaimed documentaries. Indeed, both of us were involved in the recent documentary that Jade Shaw did, a previous guest on this show. He's worked in the field of consciousness research, working with institutions exploring the subject of consciousness research with such organizations as, again, the Scientific and Medical Network, which is also an organization I've been involved in for many years. So, Rodrigo, welcome to Consciousness Hour. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very pleased to be in your show. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Again, let's everybody to know uh, Rodrigo is, is over in France, in Montpellier at the moment. So we have me in West Sussex, we've got Rodrigo in Montpellier, and we have our wonderful, as ever, Dia Nunes in the background there in Denver, Colorado. Um, right, okay. What I'd like to do initially is I know that a lot of the people who listen to this podcast and watch the podcast are very aware of, of what we talk about when we talk about brainwaves and we talk about um, various states of brainwaves. What I'd like you to do firstly is to just give a very five minute or so background to exactly what we, when we talk about brainwaves, what are we talking about and what are the different types of brainwaves and how do those brainwaves go through into consciousness and our perceptions? If you could do that, that would be really great. Yes, absolutely. So uh, brain waves are just, you know, one of the uh, neurophysiological correlates uh, associated with, you know, perception and consciousness as a whole. And uh, that just indicates certain types of occurrence uh, related to, you know, how the brains behave. So what we can see is like, for example, when you are sleeping, you have a certain type of brain wave. And when you are awake, you have other types of brain waves. Uh, although that's very, very, um, I would say, um, simplistic in reality, because we can see, for example, that uh, during REM and waking stage, you have certain types of uh, brain waves that can correlate. And although, you know, the conditions of, you know, REM state, for example, the rapid eye movements that we, we perceive during sleep uh, are, is, uh, uh, phenomenologically speaking, very different from, you know, the waking state. So those different brain waves you know, indicate just, you know, different types of uh, conditions that you know are associated with the brain. For example, when we talk about deep sleep, which is that condition of sleep that we are uh, 
um, experiencing, specifically in the first stage of sleep, we are seeing mostly delta wave. And so, for example, when we are at the onset of sleep, we're seeing an onset of theta waves. And so all those, you know, are characteristic, generally speaking. And so, for example, when we're talking about gamma wave or beta wave, they are more associated with uh, cognition. Uh, beta wave, like, for example, you are, you know, trying to uh, comprehend uh, uh, um, uh, or understand something that you are reading. And the gamma waves are those very high frequency type of brain waves where you see, for example, that you have those peak of awareness and uh, arousal and are mainly associated during the waking state with uh, intuition, perception, and understanding. So that gives us a little bit of uh, an overview of, uh, of those characteristics. But of course, beyond that, there are a lot of different characteristics of those brain waves that are associated with you know, uh, consciousness that uh, we can you know, delve into going forward. But I hope that gives a, a, a very succinct and general overview of those brain waves. Excellent, because I was quite surprised recently to read up that um, delta waves can be quite controversial. I hadn't realized that sometimes it's argued that because of the, because it's very similar, isn't it, to muscular movements. So when we move our eyes and we have sackets and everything else, it could actually be reported that, that these are actually delta waves. So I was quite intrigued by that. I wasn't aware of that. Now, I'm very interested in the work you're doing at the moment, the current direction of the work you're carrying out with Gamma Wave Technologies Limited. Now, I know this is, you're a director or you're the, the, the owner of this particular organization. I'm very keen to know, what exactly are you doing there? What is this all about? Yeah, so Gamma Wave Technologies is uh, a newly found, you know, startup. We started this, you know, uh, last July. Uh, and uh, the objective of, you know, Gamma Wave Technologies is to, uh, at the present moment, uh, um, do a headband that will help with uh, sleep, and specifically, you know, non-ordinary states of sleep. So we are working with protocol and we are doing research to induce uh, states that are non-ordinary. For example, a deep stage of you know sleep. When you are in deep sleep, we want to increment and enhance that deep sleep. What what is um, not really well known is that uh, as we age, uh, deep sleep becomes more fragmented and and incoherent. It's not as coherent as you know it is when we are you know, younger. So what we are doing is that we are incrementing, stimulating that the deep sleep. And that has a lot of you know, application because deep sleep is associated with you know, uh, physical recovery of the brain, is associated with your immunity and, so, uh, what, and, and, and memories as well. And so by stimulating the brain at during the stage, you can increase the recovery of the brain as well as you know, increase your recovery overall. And that's what we are seeing. But with that, we want also to induce, and that's, that would be a non-ordinary state of the deep sleep. But we also want to induce non-ordinary state of REM uh, uh, sleep, the rapid eye movement, which is one of the cycle of sleep. And, and for that, what we want to do is to work with lucid dreaming. So uh, the objective of, uh, of the company is really to allow us to test and to overcome the limitations that we have as consciousness to induce those states. And, and so because we are interested in non-ordinary states, we are looking as well at uh, how our consciousness is affected by uh, sleep. So let me give you an example. We know that there is an intricate relationship between how the brain behaves and how well you sleep. So the quality of your sleep has a direct effect on your ability to focus, your memory, your ability to uh, 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 have a, a, a better uh, cognitive uh, um, ability during the day. So it's intricately you know, connected. The better you sleep, the more your brain will perform at you know, higher levels of performance, the more your cognition is going to be uh, um, uh, better. And, and so what we are doing is that we are also with this headband that we are building, and we are now, doing, we are now uh, building the fifth prototype, and 
we are, you know, implementing new, you know, technologies and 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 doing research. Uh, but what what we want to do is also to measure your cognitive ability during the day. So by measuring the state of focus, your state of flow, and uh, and and measuring. Uh, for example, your capacity to to meditate, and uh, and so we have we you with that help, then you will be able to benchmark your ability ag against long term meditators, and, and so that's one as well of you know the objective. So really looking at non ordinary state and measuring those you know non ordinary state. That's that's overall the objective of you know gamma wave uh, technologies. So it's it's going to be a headband, is it, that you were while you're asleep, and is it wired in? I mean, I just understanding exactly what this is, what it's going to look like, and how it how it how somebody how it would work even. Yeah, so it's a wearable that you will put at sleep, and that will measure the quality of your sleep. So you will see with you know the headband, you know the different stage of sleep that you have gone through during the night. But during the day, you could also put this uh, this headband you know, on your head. To measure different states of you know consciousness, like you know different types of meditation. So, for example, if we we have like you know uh, tested long-term meditators within the vipassana type of you know tradition, and we see that there are certain correlates. So, for example, they are able to induce gamma wave in the temporal lobe, for example. And so, what we are going to allow you is to benchmark that ability against the ones that we are seeing. Uh, in the brain of long-term meditators. So at the present moment, we have three, you know, types of meditation that you can, you know, uh, measure yourself against. And that with the objective to allow you to be more objective about the state you are in and to perceive a little bit uh, uh, with more objectivity what's happening to you. This is fascinating. So it allows you to give yourself immediate feedback as to how you, how your brain is functioning and you know at that moment and you can adopt your action or you can actually go inwards and look and think how am i changing how i'm thinking and how my brain is functioning here what would this be for instance if we could apply this if somebody was taking psilocybin or dimethyltryptamine or anything else presumably we'd still have the same neurological feedback wouldn't we we'd know how these substances were then affecting how the brain was functioning as well and yeah. you say as well you can map the areas of the brain that are lightening up as well because you mentioned before the temporal lobes yeah. so you'll know that the temporal yeah. lobes are lightening up yes wow yes so the idea is uh, uh, of benchmarking is that you have a database you know that is you know comprehensive enough for you to compare that and that we will not have for you know a dmt or psilocybin uh, type of brain but that's the objective going forward is to look at different types of cognitive characteristics that uh, we would like to uh, measure and to be able to assess your own ability let's say for example that you know we are showing that you know during very strong type of or very focused type of concentration you are showing for example those delta wave in the frontal lobe so um with that type of you know device we could measure your level of focus and, and different things and that's the objective the objective is really you know to look at maximizing our brain performance we're using evidence-based approach and give you context in terms of the performance that you are uh, having yourself wow so what are the implications here for si such things as uh, lucid dreaming for instance because it was immediately a little light went on in my head and i thought this could be really applied to lucid, dr lucid dreaming in, in in phenomenal ways um can you expand a little bit about that or yeah, explain so, first what we mean by lucid dreaming and then we'll, yes, we'll, we'll of course. Course. yeah so yeah so the 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 idea is uh, is certainly of the headband is looking at you know inducing non-ordinary states through technology uh, the idea is to also induce the condition of lucid dream and and why is this important i will give you a little bit of context because Lucid dream is that capacity that we have to be aware during our, our sleep. So um, a lot of people can express, experience that, you know, ability once in their lifetime. And, uh, and it's when you are uh, within the dream, the dream able to, co uh, um, to control the elements of the dream. You are aware of the fact that you are dreaming 
uh, and that you can control it. So that's the level of awareness. And there is one specific characteristic of this is that the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is activated during you know, lucidity. So it's an area of the brain that is associated with your ability to recover memories, past memories, to give contextual meaning to you know the experience. So if you see like uh, let's say a frog, you're not afraid of it because you have absolutely no idea what it is. You know it's a frog. You remember your past experience and you and you do that. So that's one of the characteristics of the dream. And you have that heightened awareness. Now if we look at our brain evolution as a species in terms of our capacity to induce those states, what we see is that we look at uh, research in lucid dreaming and we look at those very experienced uh, lucid dreamers that have been inducing this for 15, 20 years. And what we see is that in average they can induce three to five you know, lucid dream per, uh, per week in, in average. So that's very, very little in terms of the amount of dreams that you can achieve during, uh, during a, one night or even a week because you can sleep and have during the cycles of sleep, you can sleep and enter into REM stage five to eight times, depending on you know, the, the time. So what we see is that even though those you know, lucid dream experiment, uh, experienced lucid dreamers are able to induce those states uh, three to five times per week, that's, very, uh, um, uh, that's a very little result in terms of you know, the capacity that we have. Even though you can say that those lucid dreamers are people who have tested all the types of techniques. So what we see is that our brain has not reached, in terms of evolution, a condition where this is more accessible. And this is why you know, technology is so important, because it will help us leap forward and stimulate those conditions in a way that we can say would lead you to induce a lucid dream more often than not. And so that's very important because for many types of, you know, for different types of, you know, cognition uh, or different types of, you know, capacity that we have in terms of our cognition, we see that we have limitations. We have limitations in terms of, you know, our ability to apprehend, you know, uh, objectively information. We see that people are, you know, subjected to, you know, uh, manipulation online and, you know, that bots can uh, um, initiate, you know, a, a type of hype in the internet that people follow without thinking. So our ability to think, if we think about this in terms of evolution, we can say that it has really been stimulated by the Enlightenment years, five, 500 years ago. So this is when we were starting to use, you know, the forebrain, uh, the prefrontal cortex, you know, making associations of ideas, trying to understand. But what we see today is that we are still subjected very much to manipulation, and we are still very much um, um, having difficulty with objectivity. So now imagine that condition of lucid dreaming that as a society we are more open to the we are just starting because if we were going to talk about lucid dreaming 500 years ago we would still be you know like philosophers at the time restricted to talk about it so it was not something that was um really well known and that's the reason for technology because we need to stimulate that uh, that condition and and really try to uh, uh, to objectify that condition and that's a second condition of why that's so important in terms of uh, 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 why use technology why we need to have those uh, technologies to help us is and and the reason is that we need to be better at objectifying that condition. Let me give you an example that would be, you know, maybe a little bit uh, uh, help us to contextualize what I mean. So um, uh, we have a very specific neurophysiology associated with, you know, each condition. And I have, because I have been doing so much research and with gamma wave technologies, we have been, you know, doing the research and on myself and others, uh, what we, what I have perceived recently is that what I thought were my lucid dreams were non-REM lucid dreams. So that's that's a very specific condition because I was never very much inclined to have lucid dream. And lucid dream 
occurs, of course, during the REM cycle of sleep. So it's when you have a very specific characteristics of the brain where you have this rapid eye movement, the REM you know, type of reality. But you can also achieve lucidity during non-REM state. And that's a reality that you know, is conveyed by science. But when I was assessing my, you know, uh, the, the data was happening in my brain, I was perceiving that I was much more inclined to have lucidity during non-REM type of state. When I thought previously, even though I knew the difference between, you know, lucid dreaming and, you know, lucid non-REM dreams, from a, a phenomenological standpoint, what I perceive is that still my objective perception of this was really um, affected by my perception of the reality, by my acceptance of what I believe was, you know, lucid dream. And so the technology here will allow us to become more objective for each of those states. If, that does, if that does make sense. I have a question to ask you as you're talking. Yes. And you, and you talk about the evolutionary process of the human being. Has it ever occurred to you guys that through this band that you're creating that it could literally create the evolutionary process of the percentage of brain um that we use we only use 10 percent and as you were talking i was just like wow this could really jump start people using more of their brains giving them more capacity to heal themselves um and i know that may sound fantastical to some people but our brains are fantabulous in reference yes. to our power. And if we opened up a different percentage of the element of creativity, we could um, heal ourselves. We could do what the yogis do. And I know that people have talked about that. Is that also your goal? Absolutely. We have to remember one thing, Dia, that uh, is very, very important here. You know, that's uh, um, something that uh, Nikola Tesla said in the past. He said that a science is a perversion of itself as long as its ultimate goal is not the betterment of humanity. So what we want to do is exactly that. We want to use that headband to improve, to jumpstart, to stimulate your ability. We were talking about lucid dreaming. You can see people with 20 years of practice and not having the ability to induce that condition. Why is that? It's because our brain has a species is not inclined uh, to have that capacity. You have some people who would have, you know, certain genetic predisposition to that. There's no doubt about this. But how can we better, you know, uh, the predisposition of the others to induce that? And that's why we need technology. That we don't need technology to become dependable or dependent. We need technology to free us, to test us, to uh, uh, put technology back into the social context in a way that it will help us so yes we want to what we want to do with that technology and that's very uh, clear is that we want to help you there is a, a law in uh, in neuroscience uh, it's called the uh, web law so that means that you know neurons firing together tend to continue firing together why is that it's because you are connecting you know neurons and and those neurons just you know do what they do they uh, continue with you know uh, uh, um, with that connection and that induce that condition so the ad law is exactly that and so if we can stimulate that condition of lucid dream then you will be more inclined to induce it yourself and that's the same for meditation if you can for example achieve certain state and perceive exactly the sensation the perception the qualia of your innate perception and how you achieve to do that and then it becomes a, um, a, a condition that becomes more normalized because you can not only objectively perceive that that's the right way to go that's how you know the yogis that are doing this for 10 15 20 years are achieving uh, and so you can then just, you know, ditch the technology. Technology should be something that we overcome, but it should be there to help us. So, yes, that's, that's exactly the objective. And I would say even more, uh, uh, Dia, is that um, the technologies that we are working on, uh, they 
indeed, you know, uh, increase the upregulation, the genetic upregulation of the neurons associated with those, you know, areas where we see are, you know, relevant, for example, during uh, uh, lucid dreaming. So uh, the objective is exactly this, to help, you know, stimulate and awaken, you know, humanity to different things. And look, I would even say this if I'm allow. I know sometimes I talk a lot, but I think that that's the, the, the important thing here is, is the one, is that one, is that we don't want to also influence people to believe in anything. You know, we want them to, through those experiences that they can achieve for themselves, get their own conclusion. So we can say that lucid dreaming is a doorway to other dimension. Yes, we can say that's my perception, that's my, you know, belief. However, I'm not inclined to try to convince anyone about that. But those experiences, when they are more... Uh, when they become naturally part of one's existence, then you will naturally open your perception of the reality and your own interpretation of what reality is. That was really interesting on so many different levels. You know, the idea we're talking here about neuroplasticity, we're talking about the idea of Hebb's law and the idea of how neurons will can be almost trained to have certain roots, the more we do things, the more. And I'm intrigued yeah. here about the idea of. Um, the idea of um, post-humanism almost, that we are using technology. We, it's technology that we effectively are creating because we have evolved to create the technology, which we're then using that technology to facilitate a jumpstart in the terms of how our brains function, which is allowing us to move into incredible altered states of consciousness, whereby we perceive alternate realities that are, are not consensual reality, but are just as real as these. Now, one of the things you sent me a, a week or so ago really blew my mind, the work you're doing. And it was very much your paper on the vibrational states and the relationship between the vibrational state and the out-of-body experience or lucid dreaming. And I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about this because this, this paper blew me away. It was extraordinary. So if you could just explain a little bit about this, and I'm sure Dia will find this fascinating as well. Yeah, so the, the paper that was, you know, presented at uh, Journal Autori Sherka is uh, an attempt really to uh, try to look at the vibrational state as a novel neurophysiological correlate. So uh, we have different no neurophysiological states. Uh, the waking state, you have the REM state that we were talking about, and you have the non-REM state. So those are the, you know, natural occurring states that are recognized, you know, by science. And so um, what uh, I have, you know, done is that I will try to um, look at, you know, the, uh, the, the, um, the vibrational state, which is a very, very specific state that is perceived uh, at, uh, at certain moments of sleep. And it it's, and is very, very peculiar and, and specific. And I was doing research into that. And, and to clarify what the vibrational state is, is, is important as well, because uh, there are lots of misconception and misunderstanding about the vibrational state. People refer to, you know, the vibrational state has, you know, tanging, shiver sensations, but this is not the vibrational state. The vibrations of the vibrational state can have, before the vibrational state, such type of sensation of a movement of, you know, energy that has, you know, a certain type of tingling, vibration, but the vibrational state in itself is the end result of those vibrations, is a state of intense positive resonance of, of, of the being. And so what I was presenting there is, uh, is the idea of, uh, uh, is trying to, to, to show what we would need from a scientific standpoint uh, to show, to present uh, in terms of scientific data to, uh, um, to accept uh, and acknowledge the vibrational state has a new state of being. And, and through that, you know, I was presenting and making a few assumptions that are associated with uh, um, our body experience. Because what happens is that often the vibrational state is seen at the onset of the our body experience. So it's not always the case you can have an our body experience without the vibrational state, but sometimes you perceive those intense vibrations that lead to the condition of exteriorization. 
And so because the vibrations are also seen during lucid dream and during sleep paralysis, that condition that is experienced when you are in sleep and you wake up and you are unable to move, I was, you know, presenting ideas that are associated with, you know, the neurophysiological correlates uh, that uh, are associated with those states. So I was presenting ideas to show um, not only, you know, how uh, the out-body experience is related to those, you know, conditions and how those conditions of lucid dreaming and uh, 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 sleep paralysis or, you know, ISP, isolated sleep, sleep paralysis, are indeed protoforms or uh, um, uh, 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 forms that lead or conditions or phenomenon, phenomena that leads to uh, all body experience. And so I was presenting, you know, theories, you know, associated with this. And my theory is that the condition of, uh, of uh, all body is associated with a condition of motor inhibition. So when, what happens during REM and, and uh, isolated sleep paralysis is that there is a motor inhibition of the nervous system. What happens is that we have a, a center in the uh, hypothalamus called the uh, ventrolateral preoptic uh, uh, nerve uh, or nucleus, and that is, you know, uh, the area of the brain that regulates the condition of REM and REM off states. And so that condition as well is associated with different uh, areas of the brain, like, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the pons, where you have the locus corollis. It's a little, you know, tiny part of the brain. And you have also the dorsal raphne. There are uh, also with that condition of REM on and off. So all those mechanisms are associated with that condition that lead then to the condition of motor inhibition. And, and so what we see and what I present there is really preliminary data of very um, of different conditions that are associated with that motor inhibition that is perceived at the onset of an out-body experience. So when you're going to sleep, you have people who are able to induce the out-body experience. And what we have tested, we have tested how the brain of those people, you know, report to that condition. And we report there very, very specific physiological conditions that I discuss about during the, uh, during the, uh, the in, in this article. And we can, you know, dwell into it, but uh, really in a sense, what we are demonstrating, what, what, what we are showing and, and demonstrating with, you know, very preliminary, you know, data is that we are able to tap into our nervous system to induce the condition of REM state at sleep onset. And that wow. is data that is known uh, in narcoleptic uh, patients. So narcoleptic patient, what they have is that they have a condition of what is called SOREM, sleep onset REM. What is that? That the REM stage that is occurring at the very early cycle of sleep. Normally, you don't have, you know, REM. You don't, you don't experience the REM state in the first one hour, one hour and a half of sleep. However, narcoleptic patients, what they have is that they have this state of uh, SOREM, where we see a REM, you know, condition, and where those, this motor inhibition is induced, okay? But what we see, is in, within certain conditions of, you know, uh, uh, um, experienced uh, uh, um, out-body uh, uh, inducers or people who are able uh, to induce the out-body experience, we see those same type of condition. And we see also another thing, which I present as well there in the, in the, uh, in the, in the article very, you know, uh, succinctly, is the condition of what that we call OBE catalepsy. So that's a very specific type of neurophysiological correlate as well. And that's what I, I see. That's what I, I present there. But in a sense, okay, what we are showing is that this condition can be stimulated, can be achieved, and it's a condition of control of the nervous system. And just let me finish with this. I mean, neuroscience today is reviewing our ability that we have to control the peripheric nervous system. Before we were thinking of the, or and that was established as a law in neuroscience, and that we cannot influence directly 
through our own command, our own volition, our ability to change and modulate the nervous system. But today there are lots of different research that are starting to show that we are indeed capable of doing that. And what I'm showing with that article is that yes, indeed, we are seeing here conditions that show that the person is able to indeed influence that condition of REM state without the pathologies associated. Because remember that sore REM is associated with narcolepsy and narcolepsy of course is a, a psychiatric, you know, uh, is a parasomnia. Uh, uh, and so it's a psychiatric condition. Wow, the implications of that is huge, isn't it? It's absolutely massive. You know, it's uh, intriguing beyond words. So in terms of moving the, this forward now, because there's so many exciting areas that we could actually pursue here, what I'm interested in is moving along to the, the ideas that lucid dreaming and sleep paralysis and everything else seem to imply we touched upon before the idea that we are in some way perceiving alternate realities or realities that are non-ordinary mental states that are opening up what uh, Huxley would call the doors of perception into yes. other areas now do you believe from your work that we'd be able to work on these in terms of tangible results from um from experimental purposes to actually show that these state these states are much more interesting than just some kind of hallucination in raised commas. Yes, absolutely. I think that um, that's you know part of the direction of the work that I'm carrying. But I'm carrying this as you know neuroscientific, uh, and and as such, I'm looking at the neurophysiological correlates. So uh, I think that we have to look at you know what's happening in the brain and what are the uh, conditions there are. Um, different and uh, peculiar that haven't been, you know, uh, seen, that haven't been researched. The vibrational state is one of those conditions. So uh, this is why, for example, with the headset that we are going to, that we are developing, you are able to, to measure your vibrational state. And so the vibrational state is key there to those conditions of, you know, uh, uh, sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming has, it shows that uh, indeed, when you are able to induce the vibrational state in those uh, uh, states, uh, you are certainly opening yourself to, you know, a different set of perception. And those perception, uh, uh, shall I say, are not at all related to hallucination and are not at all uh, correlated with the condition and phenomena or lucid dreaming or uh, uh, isolated sleep paralysis. Why is that? It's because of the condition of lucidity. When you are having, for example, an out-body experience, the experience is not related to a condition of uh, uh, hallucination or um, perception that is, you know, uh, abstract and more like a, a um, incoherent set of Things. It's uh, the out-body experience in itself, the experience that you have when you have one, is very much associated with a level of lucidity that is very clear. You perceive reality, you're coherent, you can think, you can rationalize. And so what is very interesting is, and that relates to the idea that ISP and uh, lucid dreams are portal forms of out-body experience, is that when you shift to the OB through, for example, doing the vibrational state, you perceive that level of lucidity, but the vibrational state that we can measure and induce, as you know, the research has shown, is a state of high gamma wave. And those gamma waves, they are very much associated with what? Hyper arousal, hyper lucidity, hyper connectivity, hyper association. One of the characteristics of gamma waves is that they allow you to think. You are making connections with different areas of the brain. And so you are making association of ideas. And so what we see, and that's you know, related in science, is that there is an increase in arousal, in lucidity, in consciousness, when you have more gamma waves. So if you have gamma waves during the vibrational state, and that leads you to the OBE, then you are showing that OBE in itself cannot be a condition of hallucination. More specifically so, because the correlates that you see during the vibrational state are always the same. They are related to a condition of extreme focus associated with delta, delta wave, delta brain wave, and hyper gamma wave. And so that's 
the consideration here. So we are just, you know, showing the scientific community that was before associating, you know, for example, those vibration has, you know, motor hallucination to show that, hey, it cannot be because we have very specific, very coherent, reproducible and constant neurophysiological correlates in the brain of those uh, doing uh, the VS. So the vibrational state. So yes, we are just starting to show that, okay, if we are lucid, if we are expressing lucidity, what is the reality of those, you know, uh, uh, experience? What is the reality of those phenomena? And so that's an interrogation mark because as a scientist, I'm not going to say to you what it is and what it knows. I can't say to you that, yes, you know, that's my belief that, you know, that's an alternate reality. Can I prove that? No. However, you know, if you have your experience, maybe, you know, we can as well, you know, discuss about the objectivity of that experience. And so then we can also start because we know better how those things happen in the brain, how work with the brain to start to, be more uh, inclined to have protocols and experiment that will test those possibility of you know of uh, it being a, 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 a reality beyond the one that uh, we are experiencing now i hope i was clear no totally i mean all there were so many things again triggering in my brain there in the sense that the implications here for, for instance, under these conditions, we get over the, 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 the binding problem within the brain and the idea that in some way the brain can communicate non-locally across the whole yes. of the brain. Because, of course, yeah. one of the major problems, as people may be aware of from my writings, is the yeah. idea of how we have a feeling of simultaneity when effectively there are different parts of the brain processing different areas. And in fact, even in our visual cortex, there are different in the visual systems, there's different parts of the brain monitoring different parts and communicating very, very quickly, which suggests possibly other communication channels. And I'm reminded here of something called the calcium wave, which is, I think, that probably you and I need to talk to at some stage in the future. But one of the things that you do talk about, which again intrigues me a lot, is this concept of the parabrain. Um, what do you mean by that term? And I think this probably goes back to the work of the IAC, maybe, and that there's sort of similarities there. Yes. So the the parabrain is uh, is really a theory that I've uh, tried to um, um, uh, to contextualize in in terms of neuroscience. So I'm working on a theory that would explain, you know, consciousness in a way that is differentiated uh, and that would include the uh, these type of phenomena like you know lucid dreaming you know all about the experience and so the the power brain comes or the the reality of that you know uh, of that idea comes really from you know the concept that if consciousness is not associated with the brain how does you know consciousness links to the brain to allow the conscious aspect of the brain because of course we are receiving input from the physical reality we are measuring our uh, biological suit our physical body is you know uh, perceiving the reality through physical means and so how is this transfer translated into you know the consciousness the ultimate reality and so that where you know uh, the power brain uh, comes it would be the interface between the consciousness and you know the brain so and that concept really relates a little bit with the work of you know Henry Bergson of the Elan Vital has uh, being an essential condition for consciousness uh, proposing it to be the basis of consciousness uh, uh, when uh, uh, we are you know perceiving reality but what is much more interesting our type of subject is that the power brain is also perceived his reality is perceived for example when you are going out of the body so for example do you remember probably you have seen the film dr strange where dr strange goes out of the body so when you go out of the body that's exactly the perception that you have and then what you perceive is that you perceive a form like you know uh, one of a paraphysical nature going out of the brain and that would be you know the physical reality of that you know power brain and that's as well you know uh, 
perceived with different types of you know, neurophysiological correlates that are associated with those moments of you know, the, the exteriorization. But that condition, that structure would lead you to expand your mind at the condition in pre-OBE. So you can sometimes, for example, when you are in lucid dream, be in a state where you start to have an expansion of reality. You perceive your body, you perceive you know, that you, know, you are in the physical body, but you start to perceive that there is an expansion of that, of your consciousness. And, and that leads sometimes to the condition of, you know, the old, old body experience. And, and that would also explain why the, uh, the parabrain would be, uh, 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 in certain moments, uh, in, a, in a condition of transition between the old body experience and the physical reality, as we can see during lucid dreaming or, you know, isolated sleep paralysis. So it seems that those states are a condition of opening of the doorways of perception that Oxley, you know, was referring to and leading to an expansion of the self. And, and that would also explain why you have dreams of telepathy, where you have dreams where, you know, there is a kind of uh, perception of, you know, a shadow, you know, reality that you are. Uh, somehow perceiving has an external reality, but at the same time, you know, this is uh, become entangled with your own nature because there, you are, haven't crossed that uh, boundary yet. You are not out of the body. And so that's very interesting as well because at the present moment, we cannot, uh, those conditions are, for example, uh, the clear light, and that is, you know, perceived during lucid dreaming. You have certain, you know, lucid dreamers, they are within lucid dreaming. There is no dream at all. So they are just in a condition of clear light. That is a condition associated with, you know, Buddhism uh, type of, you know, meditation of, you know, trying to achieve the clear light during, during sleep. And so you are most possibly in a condition of REM. Sometimes you are transitioning from a condition of REM to that condition of clear light. But from there, you can also transition to the out body experience. But that condition would explain a little bit the some of the characteristics of uh, of, uh, of dreams that are not really explained by today's neuroscience. Neuroscience, as I was saying, uh, explains the onset, the REM on condition associated with very specific areas of the brain. And when you have, like, for example, when you uh, have a cat and you cross set the anatomy the air is associated with REM, you, the, the, the cat will not dream any longer. So you need to explain that. You need to explain why you know, REM state can you know, uh, induce those very peculiar type of you know, reality there. I have a question to ask you. And this yes. thing, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to say it. Um, I'm thinking about the process of death. Yeah. And you talk about all of these processes as us as healthy human beings. And it feels like that that process of one leaving their body, there's like activity in the brain that is like the power brain. They're like in this continual altered powerful state. Um, and I've read stories about people being very ill and crossing over and seeing the dead come to them. I remember when my grandmother was alive and she and even trauma to the body like surgery when she had surgery which was many years ago her brother who had gotten hung actually came to her in a, in a dream I mean these are phenomenal like experiences so would Absolutely. you so would you say that um with people who are in particular body trauma type of states that the power brain is like super duper activated um and makes the experiences that you're speaking about even more expanded and why do you think that is is it because they're leaving this world because technically if we really want to be honest um our body's a hindrance it's it's a border we're not able yeah. to experience certain things I, I would love your thoughts on that 
Yeah, yeah. Can I add here as well, because it was one of the questions I was going to be asking, which dovetails beautifully into dear, we must be telepathic here. Um, <laughs> because I guess we've been doing this so long, we, we probably have become telepathic. Uh, but one of the things that it really interests me is the implications of your work for the near death experience, my cheating the ferryman hypothesis and everything else as well, because this is really doing the science and it's really what we've been wanting. And I was so delighted to hear Henri Bergson reference there. I'm delighted to hear you referencing uh, Aldous Huxley and obviously C.D. Broad and everybody else and the idea of the brain as an attenuator. So you've got a lot, lots of questions. You've got, you've got about 10 minutes left, but we've really okay. left you with a real powerful one to finish with, I think. So we, let's, let's synthesize like this. We have to see isolated sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming has, you know, transitional state to the old body state. So that transitional state is mostly or could mostly be induced by the vibrational state. Has a new state that would lead to that condition of, you know, the exteriorization of consciousness out of the body. Okay. In ISP and LD, uh, isolated sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming, you may be in a condition of partial uh, exteriorization of the consciousness. And so um, what happens is that in those states, you don't necessarily perceive reality with, has, with the same level of objectivity that you can perceive during out-body experience. And that is shown by you know the correlation of you know the neurophysiological correlates of the vibrational state vibration there leads to a condition of lucidity that can induce that condition of hyper lucidity because you see that when people are having the uh, uh, the vibrational state even if it's spontaneously it's often related to a condition of lucidity and that leads to the all body experience okay not always okay so what we see sometimes as dreams is just and that's the second point here, is just a condition that is entangled with a lack of lucidity. We are not experienced to achieve that condition of hyper-focus that is the condition of, that is perceived during our body experience. And so that's, that's one thing. And, and to come back to that you know, reality of you know, near-death experience, what we see as well is that during near-death experience, I mean, not necessarily always during near-death experience, but there are certain experiences with rats where you cut the head of the poor head there. And what you see is that you see a peak in the gamma wave just you know, during a few you know, minutes there, a few seconds actually. And so there are some experiments that also show that peak of you know, gamma wave during you know, uh, the out body or just preceding the out body experience. So for example, that was shown by you know Charles Start and his experiment with me. Can, can I just you know, jump in here? Can I just yeah. jump in? Here? This is this is intriguing. So what you're saying is that the the Gimo Borgigian experiments at the University of Michigan with the rats, that was that was gamma. That was that was gamma in the first place. Yes. And what she what she saw in that experiment is reproduced when people are about to go into out of body states. Obviously. So yeah, yeah. So wow. at least uh, well, first of all, remember that. At the present moment where, you know, the research, at least my research stand, is that we see that the vibrational state induces very high gamma waves, you know, above, you know, 60, and in some occasions up to 200 hertz. It's one occasion. But in average, it's much above that 60 hertz. And Charles Starr, you know, also reported that type of gamma wave. And of course, the vibrational state is associated with gamma wave and gamma wave is associated with lucidity and all body experience. Mm -hmm. So we can say that that condition of high gamma wave above the gamma wave that you see in lucid dreaming, because you see also gamma wave around 40 hertz during lucid dreaming is associated with that condition of hyper lucidity. Okay, that leads to the all body experience and that is also reported during your death experience at least in those, in those uh, experiments. So now to come back to the experiential reality that we were talking about. Yes, sometimes, you know, those states, as we have seen universally from millennia, uh, uh, discussion about, you know, how, you know, slip states can be a door of perception. Actually, you have works of, you know, theological works that were saying this as well, but that were saying that this was a doorway to demonic activity, right? So this is why we have never really developed this because it was suppressed. If you look at the middle age, you know, people who were trying to do this, what were happening to them? They would have a, 
near-death experience, a final one, because there would, you know, uh, uh, be, you know, uh, death. And so if you look at even in the enlightenment years, when we are talking about Descartes' theory of, you know, the brain, you know, the uh, machinery, he was saying, look, we cannot discuss about the psyche because it's the soul. We are only going to discuss about the brain because the brain, you can, we can talk about this, it's physical, it's a physical reality, nobody can condemn us. But certainly what we see is that we are perceiving here that there are commonalities in terms of uh, this reality that may lead us certainly to future experiment and that's what i want to do you know to prove that those uh, conditions has you know objective you know realities and and so uh, we see from to respond a little bit to what bia was saying is that this the the phenomenology, the experience of, you know, meeting someone is sometimes very clearly, you know, a, a condition of how body experience, but it's seen as, you know, a, 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 a lucid dream or, you know, a, a float. But let's remember something, and it's going back a little bit to what you were saying, Anthony, is we have had this knowledge for eons. If we look at the works of Plato, and we look at what he was saying. Plato um, wasn't referring to, you know, some type of, you know, subjective reality. He was talking really about an objective reality there. And, and the fact is that, you know, a lot of philosophers say, you know, that the demon, you know, the daemon and is an internal reality. In my perception, the works of uh, the work of Plato clearly stipulate that has, you know, an external objective ontological reality. And, and why is that? If you look at, you know, one of his, you know, work, which is, you know, the true work, where he says that people there were living in another type of earth that were, you know, uh, um, a condition of reality that we would experience when we would die. But in reality, what we see is that all body experience leads you to achieve those experiences. One of the things that uh, I was reading one of your interviews recently, and you mentioned who you would like to have dinner with, and you mentioned the dinner with Plato and Aristotle. <laughs> yes. And I was thinking that wouldn't it be wonderful if you and I could have dinner with Plato? <laughs> an experience and a half, I think. We'd probably dine in Plato's cave and have a <laughs> meal there, I think. Right, well, I think we'd worked it out to almost perfect perfect timing. So I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to be really intrigued and fascinated by your work, what you're doing, and how profoundly important it is in terms of paradigm change, possibly in terms of our understanding of the, the mind-brain problem, understanding Chalmers' problem of consciousness. You're doing it and you're working with it. So how can people check out your work? How can they contact you? How can they read more of your material? Because I'm sure there's going to be an awful lot of people that have been wanting to do that. Well, um, first of all, I mean, the, the, well, I've just published, you know, an article that is really, you know, giving in a sense, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, the neurophysiological uh, con um, uh, um, realities that we were talking that is associated with you know uh, isp and uh, lucid dreaming and so i really delineate there you know the direction of you know the work for us to be able to uh, 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 present uh, in a scientific manner the vibrational state has an overall you know neurophysiological state now saying that it doesn't mean necessarily that it will be recognized as you know an alternate reality but there will certainly need to recognize the neurophysiological reality of that state and uh, and that's going to be difficult but um but so i would suggest you know anyone that is interested to look at this and of course you know i have other you know uh, uh papers that i'm you know preparing i have a lot on 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 my hands specifically because you know I'm, I'm i'm the ceo of you know gamma wave technologies and we want to develop that headband that headband also to carry more research but I'm, I'm going to publish now in September, hopefully, you know, a research, a peer review of research on the vibrational state, looking at all the neurophysiological correlates in more detail. I have another research that is going to look at the OBE research to date, where I am confronting, you know, uh, the limitations of about 35 uh, theories that explain 
our body experience today in the in neuroscience there is about you know 35 theories uh, that are different that explain all body experience so you know how is that possible you ask me and and we are doing a research as well with um, in uh, in partnership with the uh, uh, is noe the uh, noetic institute uh, the science the, the swiss no uh, noetic institute where we are um, researching a very very peculiar and very uh, um, uh, experience uh, 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 a person that induce you know our body experience at will, and we're looking at the neurophysiological correlates, and that's really going to be very interesting because he does our body experience in a very different way that I do, and I've been learning with him a lot, and uh, and so that shows how complex is is that, and I also would like you know to present more research into this motor inhibition uh, uh, hypothesis that I've presented there in the in the article and uh, and so yeah more is to come if you'd like to stay in touch you know you can contact gamma wave technology so uh, in our web page and uh, and say hi and uh, express your interest in the headband that we are developing if you are an investor be welcome to contact as well because as you know those things you know require a little bit of you know the material paradigm you know to be you know uh, uh, to, to come to life. Wonderful. So when we we when we upload onto YouTube, I'm sure that Dear will actually put all the, the contact details so people can contact because the work you're doing is absolutely fascinating and, and extremely important. Um, right. Okay, Rodrigo. Thank you so much. It's been a, a fascinating hour. Um, thank you so much as well. Okay, yeah, and Anthony and so Dear for for inviting me. Absolutely. Without Dia, this would not happen. And we, we always, she is the person that makes the wheels work in the background. Our Thank next you. guest, right, our next guest next time for next month, it will be the second uh, Sunday of the month. And it will be a similar theme, but this time from more the experiential, when we have um, a fascinating guest called Kaz Coronel, who's an internationally famous DJ, who's also experienced some fascinating out-of-body experiences, um, and various other things as well. So Kaz is going to be a fascinating future guest. And by the way, Kaz, although she probably may mention it or may not, is a direct descendant of Benedict Spinoza, the philosopher. So we have somebody here who has links to really deep philosophy, but we're going to be talking music. We're going to be talking so many issues. So everybody, thanks again for listening in. And uh, hopefully we will see you all in a month's time. Check it up on Dia's H2O Network website uh, on, on uh, YouTube, where you've got this interview and you've got all the other interviews that I've done in the past. And I'll be uploading this interview onto my website in the next few days. But thanks for spending an hour with us. And we look forward to seeing you again in a month's time. OK, thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.